Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of our attendees to today's webinar, to the first module of our Draeger Neonatal Nursing course. I would like to uh, welcome you all to our first module, Hemodynamics in the NICU and the Golden Hour. And uh, before we start, I would like to quickly check if you could use raise your hand button. It is on the right hand side on the GoToWebinar dashboard to demonstrate, to show to me that you can see the slides and you can hear the voice. Excellent. So quite a few used the raise your hand. Perfect. Thank you so much for dialing in to our first webinar. And um, today I am happy to introduce our guest speaker, our moderator and um, our core organizer of this um, digital neonatal nursing course, Lin Ms. Linda Pretoria, Pretorius. Uh, Ms. Linda is a de developmental care consultant from South Africa. She has graduated from University of Natal Eddington Campus with a diploma in nursing, um, and she pursued a career in neonatology and pediatrics. Linda then continued to work and run various NICUs and PICUs and worked in the UK before returning to South Africa uh, to work for NetCare Group and their hospital division. She worked as a unit manager and as a trauma and resuscitation coordinator. She also works as a trauma program manager. However, her love remains um, for all things related to neonatal care. And in 2015, she established the uh, NetCare Human Milk Bank system because she is a true believer in the important, importance of breast milk um, and breastfeeding. Linda has since lectured extensively in the neonatal care and pediatric fields and presented papers in Botswana and Mauritius. She has also designed a lecture series for Draeger for the NICU nurses course in Zimbabwe. Uh, since 2019, Linda has run Little Miracle Touch, with, which helps parents and babies make the transi transition from hospital to home. And um, she has also been actively involved uh, in the organization of the Draeger Premature Days. They usually happen on November 17th uh, with extensive lectures, case studies, discussions, and um, also paper presentation. Um, and uh, today, Linda will be doing a lecture on the hemodynamics in the NICU and the golden hour. Uh, my name is Margarita Singer. I'm the regional marketing manager for uh, neonatal care at Draeger Middle East and Africa. And today I will be also sharing a technology insight on how Draeger technology can support the neonatal care. So with this quick introduction, I would like to give word to our lecturer today, Ms. Linda Pretorius, and um, she will be then um, doing the webinar on the hemodynamics in the NICU and the golden hour. So Linda, the stage is yours. Thank you, Margarita, and thank you to Draga for this opportunity. Um, and I'm going to just go straight into the lecture. We will be doing about 50 minutes of this lecture and then we will break for questions. After that, we'll have a short comfort break and we will return to the second part of the lecture if that's all fine with all of you. So we have chose hemodynamics for a reason because we know that the hemodynamics of the baby in intensive care already tells us a lot of what is happening to that baby. Um, so when we look at the transition of the baby, the transition from uterus can be um, quite a traumatic experience for the dead baby and adaptations are quite necessary for this baby for it to occur very um, uh, successfully. 
This means that the care needs to be integrated, that it needs to be a multidisciplinary team, and that the family needs to be part of this team. Because remember, up until the minute this baby is born, the baby and the mum are one unit. That baby really has no idea what is coming its way. Up until the minute it is delivered, this baby has known only its mother's voice, its mother's um, abdominal sounds and heart sounds, its mother's touch, and the warmth of the uterus. And now we are going to take this baby out of this environment and move it into an intensive care environment. Remembering that at this stage, when this transition must happen, these babies are often shocked and they're often premature. And because they're premature, that doesn't mean that they're just a small baby. They are actually still a growing fetus. And as nurses, we have to take this into consideration when we are working with these babies. Okay, let's see if... Oh, I don't know why I must. Oh, there we go. So we have the seven pillars of neonatal healing. Um, and I always, when consulting with parents, come across the fact that they think that ICU is going to fix this baby. No, we save lives in intensive care. The healing comes afterwards. And at the moment, across the globe, the parents are becoming a very important and very integral part of this partnership between multidisciplinary team, the baby and the parent. So we have to partner with parents and families. We have to bring them in because they take that baby home ultimately. And very often, especially now in COVID, they actually don't even know that baby. Positioning and handling it in the intensive care is very, very important. We need to safeguard the sleep. We need to minimize the stress and pain. We need to protect the skin and we need to optimize the nutrition. And this is what sits on the shoulders of every nurse. Now I'm going to go and talk to you about the golden hour. So let's just explore the golden hour. The golden hour is something that started in and around about 2002 when there was a worldwide study done on a drug called Nova 7. And it, it was a, a drug that helps with clotting and it was brought into the trauma world. And what actually transpired was that when they rolled out this drug to be tested worldwide and as um, clinicians and as, as medical people, we now understand the testing much better having gone through the COVID vaccine testing. They decided to put the, um, th this Nova 7 um, rollout together with an incredible amount of protocols that every emergency department or every trauma unit needed to follow to be part of the study. Well, when they got to the second part of the study, they actually had to stop the study because what they realized was because they had put in all these protocols and everybody had, had, had adhered to the protocols, the time of resuscitation was reduced, the time of resuscitation was standardized, and the outcomes of that resuscitation was that much better. So they really battled to prove that the drug had prevented um, a lot of the hemorrhaging or the clotting problems that occurred because the protocols that they had put in place had actually standardized care almost across the globe for the trauma patient. And that's where the golden hour and the 60 minutes for a resuscitation in your emergency department evolved from. Since then, this idea has now been taken on by the neonatal community, and it is a young thought pattern within the neonatal community currently, but it has a lot of kudos at the moment, and we are seeing tremendous improvements with units that have taken on the golden hour. 
So what is the golden hour? The golden hour can be described as the first hour post delivery in both the term and the pre the preterm and the term newborn. And it ensures that medical staff practice evidence-based medicine, improving the long-term outcome of this newborn. Um, we have got an article available if you want it. And what basically the, 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 the idea is, is to standardize the care, to practice evidence-based care, and to take care of that baby in a gentle, caring manner, ensuring minimal problems, and actually in that hour, you will buy yourself a lot more time to actually be able to stabilize this baby. So as I said, it was adopted from adult trauma where it was the first hour post injury and how, it's, how the handling of the injury in that first hour actually influenced the outcome of the trauma. Dr. Reynolds et al. started the golden hour in the neonatal world. And though the studies are very few at the moment, um, they, are, they are supported, they are positive, and most neonatologists really, really are starting to look at this. So when we look at the golden hour per se, we are looking at the... Um, the start of the recess, which is actually firstly counseling and dealing with the actual um, parent and, 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 and counseling and planning the resuscitation as far as possible. It is also post delivery. So post resuscitation, it's also the transportation of the baby, as well as giving the baby as much support as we possibly can and allowing it to stabilize. And what we have learned is that we have already been able to show that there's a reduction in hypoglycemia, intraventricular hemorrhages, BPD or bronchopulmonary dysplasia, as well as retinopathy of the newborn. So as more and more of us practice this and do it correctly, and actually have it all done, we are now seeing an improvement. So it is all about the gentle, timiest, effective, non-invasive interventions where possible, allowing the transition from fetus to newborn. That is what you're going to do. And I'm going to repeat this. It's about gentle, timiest, and effective non-invasive interventions where possible allowing the transition from fetus to newborn. So when we look at this, it, it, it is all with regards to what we are trying to achieve. So it's all about assessment, communication, and support. So when we hear about this, we need to plan it. The lower the gestational age, the higher the morbidity and the mortality rates. What this means is that the, 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 the lower the gestation, so if the baby is a 24 or a 26 weeker, if the resuscitation is not planned and practiced regularly, this will make the baby at higher risk for mortality and morbidity um, problems. We also need for the parents to be informed and allowed to be able to make decisions regarding resuscitation and post care. And even if it is going to be um, palliative care, we need to allow the parent to be able to make that decision. We also need to realize that there is a shifting in care and outcomes constantly. Um, 20 years ago, 26 weekers survived, but they had a huge number of morbidity when they did survive. This has now changed, and we are now seeing that morbidity we saw in 26 weekers transferred to 24 weekers and 22 weekers, actually. And the 24 and 26 weekers do phenomenally well because of all the work that has been done within the entire um, situation. So the golden hour process 
has to do with skin to skin, transportation, and the breast milk, um, giving breast milk. So what it means is that we have to reduce parental anxiety, improve their knowledge, and facilitate communication between parents and the medical staff. And um, everything that we do should be evidence-based, and we should know it. It should be done in a multidisciplinary team where we include the obstetric department, the neonatal department, the nurses, everybody working together. Everybody needs to know what everybody is going to do. So if you look at the recess process, generally what you will see in a recess process is that there is job allocation and the, the certain people are placed in specific roles and they have specific tasks to complete. And this is also what is being suggested within the neonatal golden hour. So the first thing that we suggest is that there is a resuscitation huddle. What this means is before we even deliver this baby, we have what is called a huddle. So this is not just about equipment and checking equipment, but it is the recess team knowing which tasks have been allocated to them and what they are supposed to do. This reduces confusion and prevents near miss events. So everybody knows what is going to happen. And at this stage, I need to say the following. Whoever is in charge of the recess huddle is the voice that is heard. If you go and speak to many um, uh, uh, parents post um, resuscitation of a, a, a infant at birth, what you will find is what they found extremely distressing is the noise level and the chatter and banter and the behavior amongst the staff. So it becomes very important that one person speaks and says what needs to be done and the other people do and deal with it. Once the resuscitation's over and the baby's stable, we can come back and debrief. And that is when you can have your say if you weren't happy with what is. But up until we have that baby stable and in an intensive care, the person who has been made in charge remains in charge and the other staff do as they are told. At the same time, neonatal intensive care needs to be informed and they should also allow staff to prepare for this baby. There is nothing more disturbing than somebody crashing through an intensive care door without staff actually knowing the patient is coming. It, it often things go missing because people are not listening because they are so busy trying to get their minds around what is happening. So for this reason, checklists are important in both areas. The maternal history is very important and it needs to be carried over to all the staff, including the staff in neonatal intensive care. So there must be discussions between the doctors, there must be discussions between the nurses so that everybody is on the same page. In South Africa, one of the biggest problems that we often come across is the fact of the matter is that the maternity staff don't talk to the neonatal staff. And what often goes missing is that breast, uh, breast milk and the, and, and, and the actual expressing of breast milk doesn't start early enough. The long-term knock-on effect of that small little um, task going missing is that if a mother doesn't pump within the first six hours of delivering the baby, she will not be able possibly to provide 500 mils on day 10. And if she can't prevent, pr pr produce 500 mils on day 10, she is back going to battle to breastfeed that baby long term. Breastfeeding helps with attachment. So 
whatever happens in this first golden hour has a long knock-on effect to the baby long term and we want to prevent that so if we look at um, the whole idea of um, the golden hour one of the first things that come out is this new idea of um, delayed cord clamping and over the next few months as we go through the modules you will become very comfortable with delayed cord clamping now what delayed cord clamping is is the clamping of the cord once the circulation has stopped from the placenta to the baby it occurs generally in the first um, from 30 seconds post delivery to about three to five minutes after delivery and what it allows to happen is that the circulatory volume returns to the baby in the term baby it could mean as much as 100 moles being returned but where possible in both the prem and the term baby we do need to allow delayed cord clamping to happen for us before we if 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 possible before we start resuscitation and what does this mean it means that there's less intraventricular hemorrhages there's less transfusions for these babies and there's a lower risk of necrotizing enterocolitis what it does mean is that we often see that these babies need a bit of phototherapy but that is not a problem so what we do is the cord clamp goes on between 30 seconds and three minutes it um, helps return the blood from the from the placenta to the baby it can help and affect um, the newborn respirations and gravity will work so the baby needs to be a bit lower than the placenta for it to be effective also when we speak about um, the golden hour the, we have to look at the thermal process now one of the, the the biggest problems here is that very often in theaters they seem to set the temperature too low the, the if there is going to be a cesarean section we need the theater temperature as well as the delivery room temperature if it's a vaginal delivery to be between 26 and 20 Eight degrees because a baby that's temperature is below 36.5 is a baby that is going to end up being hypothermic and hypothermic in itself will create problems it has a huge knock-on effect because it is a very dangerous time um, during the resuscitation that the baby will lose an incredible amount of heat so if you look at the pictures on the right hand side of your screen you can see how conduction will lose heat so the baby's heat is if if it's not a heated pad or a warm pad or um, a pad that has a few blankets on the baby can lose heat into the equipment convection has to do with air cons has to do with movement of air through the unit evaporation becomes a very very important point in a patient or in a micro prem and a prem baby because their skins are incredibly thin and they lose fluid rapidly that way and they also will lose fluid rapidly through the radiant heater or, or the radiation quite easily later on as well and this needs to be considered at all times keeping a baby covered is very important and making sure that they're in equipment which can help for that the next we remain with hypothermia so hypothermia leads to a significant increase in the following we see lower APGARs at 10 minutes as, and, and often below 7. We see late onset sepsis happening. We see hypoglycemia happening. We see respiratory distress happening. And 
as I have said before, the delivery rooms temperature or the theater must be kept above 26 degrees Celsius. We also suggest and we prefer you placing the baby in plastic wrap, um, so-called glad wrap or plastic wrap, or you can put the baby into um, a, a quality food type bag. Um, just remember that you do not put the head in the bag, but that the baby is in the bag up into the shoulders. Or you can use a product on the market which is available. And where possible, we will try to do skin to skin. Now, um, this is very, very important is that the latest uh, paper was um, a paper was published in January called the delivery room cuddle. And this is where we are now taking babies of up and even as, as, as low a gestation as 22 weeks. And we are stabilizing these babies post recess and we are then wrapping the baby, keeping it warm and handing it back to the parent. Even if we have to bring the ICU to the delivery bed or the theater table, and allowing the mother and the father to hold and cuddle that child for at least five minutes. What this means long term is that A, mum's milk production will improve, and B, the depression that is found that often happens and occurs because the baby's whipped away to intensive care actually doesn't need to happen. The nurse from intensive care and the doctor can stabilize the baby and hand it back to the parent. Because very often that will be the only cuddle they will have with that baby for the next three or four weeks sometimes. And it's very important to give that opportunity. It is not true skin to skin, but it allows for what we call attachment. And it allows for the baby to stabilize because what happens is the baby hears the mom's voice and it now comes out of what we call the flight and fright reaction and it's able to regulate. So what do we want to happen with the respiratory process? And what you will see is to the side I have put what the preductal saturation should be over a period of 10 minutes. It is not important for you to get a saturation of 100% or a totally pink baby by one minute post delivery. It is transitional. That baby is built to take its time of up to 10 minutes to stabilize. When we talk preductal, this means that if you do have access to a saturation probe, you are going to put it on the right hand because the right hand, the right arm comes off before the patent ductus arteriosus. And that will give you the saturation that is going to the major organs. Up until the baby takes its first breath, gaseous exchange happens via the placenta. With the first breath, blood is directed to the lung and inflates with air. So both babies, preterm and term, can develop respiratory distress. Babies above 35 weeks gestation are resuscitated now in room air while babies under 35 weeks receive oxygen only on a setting of 21 to 30%. So we do not need and we should not start at 100%. We go back to that gentle transition. Bagging or positive pressure ventilation is only required after five minutes if cyanosis persists despite a heart despite the heart rate being above 80. So if the heart rate is above 80 and the saturations are taking a bit longer, you do not need to bag the patient or to actually give it that inspirational air. As long as it's getting supplementary oxygen, 
that's all it means. Even with invasive support, the saturations only need to be 90% at 10, 10 minutes. And please, we have to have to wean the oxygen as fast as we possibly can, because it is during this first phase where the oxygen toxicity and the damage occurs. If there's meconium stained lycor and the baby is vigorous, you can leave the baby with the mum. If the baby is floppy with meconium stained lycor, then resuscitate as normal, but do not attempt deep suction. CO2 monitoring is important where possible. And if there is ventilation, which is required on this baby, please use four to six mils per kilogram. The idea is to reduce the work of breathing and to avoid apnea. That's what you're trying to do. It is better to try and assist ventilation initially before you just intubate the patient. CPAP should be trialed before intubation. Sustained lung inflation leads to lung recruitment. So that what, what we're saying there, and, and you will learn that next month, is by holding the oxygen there and giving slight pressure, you get lung recruitment. Patient-triggered ventilation, hypercapnia, and targeted saturations, humidification, and early extubation in these babies is very important. So sustained lung inflation immediately post-delivery allows a baby to achieve functional recruitment capacity. This allows for better alveoli recruitment, improved pulmonary flow, decreased pulmonary resistance. There is a movement of fluid which will occur out of the alveoli. There's a universal lung expansion and there's better lung compliance. So allowing that lung to slowly recruit is far better. So how do we do this? Um, this is a bit difficult because I can't actually see the side of the screen. But basically, it is by doing positive um, pressure ventilation with the nasopharynx and that the pressure from the auto pulse, auto breath, neo, um, the neo breath um, should be at 25 centimeters and that it is inflated for 5 to 15 seconds using a neonatal facial mask. And this is followed up with CPAP or, 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 or yeah, CPAP at, at a nasal CPAP at 5 um, centimeters of water. If um, respiratory failure persists, apnea and gasping, or the rate is less, then we re repeat this maneuver again. This maneuver remains very, very important. So, what are the goals is, is to reduce as much trauma as we can, and what that will do. So previously, years ago, when we resuscitated, we put the, the um, bag valve resuscitate on the baby's face, and you could often hear the peep valve lifting, and it was a hard maneuver. This is a very light maneuver that is now done. And the reason why we're doing that is to prevent barrow trauma and to prevent um, uh, uh, atelector trauma, bio trauma and rio trauma and those will be covered in the actual respiratory block what they mean and what they are so when we vigorously resuscitate right in the beginning we do the most damage the resuscitation has to be done very very carefully and here we talk about the insure method or we talk about the LISA method when we're giving surfactant. If we are giving surfactant as um, preventative or early rescue, 
So we can use the Lisa method or we can use the Ensure method. And the Ensure method talks about intubate, give the surfactant, extubate, and put the baby on CPAP. This can all happen within the first 10 minutes of a baby's delivery. And if that baby stabilizes on CPAP, it can now be wrapped and returned back to the parent for a period of time before being moved to intensive care. This will lower BPD, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, and air leak. And as we've said there, consider commercial surfactant early rather than later, as it is more effective prior to the onset of respiratory distress. Cardiac support. When we look at cardiac support, we need to look at the capillary refill. And this should be done over the sternum, where we press for five seconds and then count for three and see how it refills. We observe the heart rate and the blood pressure, and we try and gain venous access as soon as possible. Remember that adrenaline or ephedrine remains the drug of choice and it needs to be diluted. And the reason why you are using the adrenaline here is for its inotropic effect. So what you're trying to do is improve the blood pressure to allow the heart to beat at its optimum. Because remember that the premature infant and even the term babies heart is not yet a muscle. It is acting more like a tendon. It is also better to give the adrenaline peripherally or via the umbilical venous catheter rather than pushing it down the, um, um, the uh, endotracheal tube. Um, there, you know, there are papers now coming out that it worsens the respiratory distress by giving it via. But if you have to, that needs to happen. Hypovolemia must be addressed immediately. And this would be in a baby where there has been a hemorrhage. So it is generally the first dose is given as 10 moles of fluid per kilogram over a five or 10 minutes period and what generally is given here is packed cells of blood not whole blood and the reason why it's given over five or ten minutes is that if it is given slower you will have the fluid shift into what is termed third space so if the baby is hypovolemic and what does the hypovolemic baby look like it is a pale baby with um heart rates that are often very high, battling to breathe, needing a lot of oxygen. Those babies, we do need to give that fluid fairly quickly. Blood pressure readings are a poor indication at this stage, and this is often high due to circulating cortisol and not a true reflection of what's happening at cellular level. And this whole idea of cortisol, we will explore um, in the lecture after the break. You may um, be better off looking at lactate readings. Um, and it's best to be treating shock in the compensatory phase, which would be this resuscitation phase of which you have in the first hour. Please use your fluids judicially. Um, don't give too much fluid. Consider inotropes because, um, and, and how do we actually consider this? Well, these will these maneuvers will all be taught to you um, as as this course progresses. But one of the um, ways of checking whether you need fluid versus inotrope is to do a blood pressure on the right arm, and then to um, get that reading, and then to lift the babies both the baby's legs gently and repeat the blood pressure reading. And if the blood pressure reading goes up, we know that that baby still requires fluid. <clears throat> if the blood pressure remains hypotensive, that is when we should consider an inotrope for that baby. It's a quick and simple maneuver for if we are caught and we don't have all the equipment that we need. 
We do need to treat sepsis as early as we possibly can. And to remember that um, persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn often occurs in babies with meconium aspiration. So sepsis and prematurity are the largest reasons for death. And what becomes absolutely essential is that hand washing and hand spray is the most effective way of treating sepsis. And I think nowhere in the world has it become more apparent than during the COVID period with all the sanitizing that's going on. Please remember <clears throat> that we consider this baby to have been born in a sterile phase. And so everything that we do should be done in an aseptic manner prior to us just going ahead. So we should make sure that we use an aseptic technique. And this includes when administering surfactant, when preparing for IV therapy, when putting up and drawing up um, TPN, when giving antibiotics, and when changing CPAP or ventilatory circuits. When we get to the monitoring and recording of the golden hour, it becomes very, very important. Because not only will we later be able to go back and look at it, but during that resuscitation, we actually almost need one person just to dot jot down on a piece of paper what has been done. At one minute, baby handed to pediatrician. At one minute and 20 seconds, baby was dried, um, heart rate checked, ECGs, um, um, electrodes placed. At one minute 30, saturation probe put in place. At one minute 40, IV therapy um, commenced by whoever. All of this becomes very, very important because from a medical legal point of view, it gives us a lot of um, information and gives us support. But also if retro studies are done, it allows for it to happen. During that entire system, communication should occur with the parents. And here, if there is an anaesthetist with the patients, they play a very important role because they can interpret what you as the resuscitation team are doing and they can carry it forward to the parent and explain it in a gentle manner to say, yes, they are doing CPR, but I can see the heart rate is coming up so that they are helping with that baby all the time. Also at this stage, it becomes very important that we um, ensure that the baby is fed as soon as possible and transportation of the baby at this stage is very, very important. When we look at the family, we need to realize that as much and as, 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 as professional as we are, it is not our baby. That baby belongs to a family. It belongs to a mother and a father. And the parents need to be educated as much as possible beforehand, if you have the time. They need to be explained, and all possible scenarios need to be explained to them. I spoke to a mother recently um, who had her 26-weeker whipped away into intensive care. And one of the things she said was, I was never in, uh, prepared for the noise or what it looked like when I walked into intensive care and saw my baby lying on that table. They do not understand that it is a resuscitator or an incubator. They really just don't see it that way. And one needs to explain to them that the baby is going to have monitoring equipment on it, even if you take a picture and you show them what it might look like. As soon as possible, parents should see and hold an infant to allow the dyad to um, stabilize. The dyad is the relationship between the primary caregiver and the baby. And what you will find 
is that the minute that the mother or the father hold that baby and start speaking to it, the baby gets internal control and it is able to stabilize. Where possible, allow for privacy if a baby is passing away. If a baby has passed away, give parents 20 minutes by themselves without you going in and out or checking. Just give them that time to grieve. Um, I think we will now open up for any questions. Um, Thank you, Linda, very much. Um, yes, so for those participants who have questions, please type them in in the question bar in the dashboard of the GoToWebinar. It is on the right-hand side. There is a space where you can actually type in your questions. So um, currently, I don't see any questions. Um, maybe we'll give it a few minutes for any participants to ask their questions. I think we have the first question coming in. Please, could you repeat why SPO2 prop should be placed in the right hand? Okay, so if you were to go and look at the anatomy and physiology of um, the um, vascular system, what you would notice on the aorta is that the blood supply to the brain and the right hand part of the liver and kidney actually comes off prior to the ductus. So you will get what we call the preductal reading, the, the actual SpO2 on the right hand. Very often, if you want to um, see whether a duct is problematic, if the duct is still working, People will ask you, put the probe on the right hand, look at the saturation, and then put it on the left hand and look at the saturation. That is one of the easiest ways in the field to tell whether you are dealing with persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn. So the, 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 the saturation probe that is on the right hand will give you the preductal reading, the blood coming off out of the heart prior to the duct. Now, what happens is that when babies are born, we actually firstly need that ductal, ductus arteriosus, the PDA, to close with pressure. So when the baby breathes air in, the air in the lung gives us pressure and the ductus closes physically. That ductus will take up to 8 to 12 hours to close. And once it is closed, it needs pressure to keep it closed so that it can grow closed. Thank you very much, Linda. Um, there's been another question. Kindly repeat the part on cardiovascular fluid replacement. Fluid versus blood, roll of blood pressure. Okay, so when we when a baby is born, generally, generally, babies are not volume depleted unless there has been what we call an APH, an um, uh, antipartum hemorrhage, or there was a hemorrhage in delivery, or if it was a traumatic delivery, we had a core tear, a, a cord tear, or there was a lot of blood lost that would be when we would need to replace fluid. And generally the rule of thumb there is that you would replace with, um, uh, with packed cells, not whole blood. And it starts off at 10 moles per kilogram. So later on, as the course progresses, we will talk a lot about um, uh, dehydration in babies. And you see this by the heart rate. And um, generally, the rule of thumb is that you replace it 10 moles per kilogram. So um, you start with 10 moles. And if that doesn't work, then they generally move to 20 moles per kilogram. So if you're dealing with an 800 grammer, 
we generally would replace the, the initial fluid we would replace would be eight moles. But if we are looking at a three kilogram baby, we possibly would replace that blood with 30 moles of blood, um, if that makes sense. And we are moving away of the whole idea where very often people talk about fluid replacement being done over an hour or two. That only allows for fluid to move into third space. If you want to give fluid to improve a blood pressure, you have to give it over a faster period of time. That's why it's given over five to 10 minutes. Excellent, Linda. Thank you so much. Um, there's another question. You have mentioned that monitoring of ETCO2 was recommended during the golden hour. Would you recommend a monitoring method in particular? So it has to be a side method of monitoring it, not an inline method, because remember that when we're dealing with babies, and I'm sure that this will be covered fairly extensively in the respiratory module, we have to look at what we term dead space. So um, often um, CO2 monitoring is done on a side port rather than within the circuit in, in especially the premature infant because it, um, if it's in line as such, it increases your dead space. So the side monitoring is the best. It doesn't always happen, especially in um, Africa. It is a very expensive method of doing it. Um, and often a blood, a, a, a arterial blood gas is cheaper, and that would be the way that you would monitor it. Um, but if you have sophisticated uh, monitoring, it can be done via a side port. Excellent. Thank you so much, Linda. Um, there was a general question on whether the, re the recordings will be available. Yes. The webinar is being recorded and the recording will be distributed to everyone who participated and who have registered for the webinar. Um, I think if there are no more questions, we're going to take a break and we're going to have a second part of this lecture done by Linda and we will have another opportunity to answer your questions. So um, feel free to type in your questions and we will address them at the second part. Also another organizational thing, at the end of the webinar, there will be a survey where we would like to get your feedback on the webinar itself, on the content, and most importantly, on the topics that you would like to learn more. We would use this, um, uh, uh, we would use this uh, to further optimize our delivery of the content for this neonatal nursing course. Um, so we're going to take a six minute break. So basically we're going to come back at uh, exactly an hour. So basically at, well, in Dubai it's going to be uh, 3 p.m. So in South Africa it's going to be 1 p.m. So basically we are back here in six minutes and we will continue with the lecture. So please stay online and come back to us in now five minutes. Thank you. Okay, so we are now back to the webinar. Thank you for staying with us. And uh, we are going to continue with the second part of the hemodynamics and golden hour um, lecture today with um, Ms. Linda Pretorius, and then um, after that, we will be looking into the technology insight. So stay tuned. Um, Linda, so I think we can continue with um, our presentation. And Linda, yes. Okay. <laughs> Hi. So um, what, before we go into the structural problems, I just want to chat you through. Um, what actually happens. So when a baby um, is born and is stressed in utero, what very often occurs is that during the um, birthing process, the baby secretes cortisol. 
so we all do this. Um, what happens is if you were to open your front door and you would find a large lion there, automatically your sensory system kicks in. You will smell it. You will feel it. You will see it and your heart will beat and you will know that this is trouble. This is what we call the flight, the fight and flight reaction. And what happens during fight or flight reaction is that the brain secretes cortisol and this allows you, it's a cortisone, this allows you to run faster, get somewhere, to, to make the, the right decisions. And cortisol in short doses is very healthy. However, cortisol long-term is damaging. And this is what often occurs with these babies is that because we don't do the resuscitation gently and carefully, long-term, they continue to secrete cortisol. Long-term cortisol causes um, the brain to change its pathways or to create new pathways. And long term, what will happen to these babies is that they will become anxious. So how we deal with that golden hour, how calm we do it, how planned it is, how carefully we do it, that will give us a, a far better child or baby in the intensive care unit because its stress level is not as high. And that is why the latest progression going to the delivery room or the theater cuddle is starting to make such a big difference because that cortisol level can come down. The only way you can counteract the cortisol level is by something called oxytocin. Oxytocin is another hormone that is secreted, but it's only secreted in specific situations. So you will be able, call, um, oxytocin happens um, as a baby's born vaginally and there's all that pressure on the baby that releases oxytocin. It, and if you have a deep massage, that releases oxytocin. Um, breastfeeding releases a certain amount of oxytocin and you will um, have oxytocin release if somebody hugs you very tightly for about 30 seconds or the most obvious one for adults because that's what oxytocin is called is the love hormone is during sex. So the only way you can counteract a cortisol and over secretion of cortisol is by giving the baby an opportunity to have an oxytocin release. The most common one there is the skin to skin. And the purpose with the golden hour is to get that child stabilized as quickly as possible and allow for skin to skin where possible. But let's look at the structural problems of this baby that we are faced with. If you look at this little picture, you can see that they are very different. So their, no, their nasal passages are narrow. Remember, babies don't have sinuses. That's why we can intubate via the, no, the nose. Generally, we would intubate other people orally. They have a large tongue. They have a very high larynx. They have a narrow subglottis. They have a floppy, omega-shaped epiglottis. They have a thin mandible, which is underdeveloped. And this often is problematic long term because when it comes to sucking, they will battle with that and they have a very large occiput. So let's look about, let's talk about the neutral thermal environment. This is a very, very important concept. If you don't have a neutral thermal environment, you will lose control over the baby because the baby will lose heat in four methods, convection, evaporation, conduction, and radiation. So you have to have the environment where that specific baby is kept in as neutral to what that baby requires. 
And a micropremie does not have the same neutral thermal environment to that of a term baby. Temperature control is the most essential part of dealing with a newborn baby. Keeping that baby warm will allow for the baby to stabilize. Hypothermia remains a significant problem, especially in the third world and the developing world. The fetus's temperature is generally 0.5 degrees centigrade higher than the mother's core temperature. And this happens because the baby is generating heat as well as the surrounding temperature the baby was in, in the uterus. So what happens if a baby is cold? The baby increases its oxygen con consumption, which means it starts breathing faster. The lungs don't take up the oxygen as well. What does that lead to? Pulmonary vasoconstriction. The O2 in the tissues goes down because you now have vasoconstriction because the respiratory rate, the compensation of breathing fast, often means the blood pressure is dropping. And what's the body's way of controlling the blood pressure? Peripheral vasoconstriction. And then you will get anaerobic glyc glycolysis. And what this means is that there's a decrease in PO2 and pH. And what happens? The baby develops a metabolic acidosis. So by keeping that baby or allowing that baby to get cold, you will worsen the respiratory distress. You will make the oxygen consumption higher and the need for oxygen much higher. The baby will lose weight because it's now got to generate energy. The PO2 goes down, the pH goes down, and we have a metabolic acidosis. At birth, the baby's temperature drops <clears throat> rapidly due to it being in a cooler environment and significant evaporation. This is very common in the micropren because the baby is born, the area is cold, but the skin is very, very thin. And so it, evaporation occurs even faster. The body mass ratio is a problem. The exposed body posture is a problem. So even though we try and keep that baby wrapped while we're resuscitating, just the head and the chest being exposed is a big part of it. There's no subcutaneous fat. There is poor vas vasomotor control. So the baby can't really generate, get its blood pressure up or conserve its heat by um, dropping its, its it, you, by vasoconstricting. So that, that becomes a problem. And um, the skin is very thin with high permeability. And this exposes the baby to significant mortality and morbidity. Babies can't shiver or alter their positions. And so, um, they will activate thermogenesis or the use of brown fat. And this is a poor method of heat and in it, it's very energy expensive. So they will lose weight very quickly. The prem babies can't flex. So they will lie there like little frogs, more areas exposed to the cooler air. They lose fluid quicker. So it becomes important to encapsulate that baby, to keep it in something where it's warm. Um, once the lecture is over, we will be crossing over to Dubai and um, uh, Margarita will show you how an incubator actually works and how important humidity becomes in an incubator and why incubators are such an essential part of what happens in a neonatal intensive care. If you ask my opinion, there should be more incubators than resuscitators because babies in incubators are safe. Thermogenesis. Um, so the babies utilize their thyroid stimulating hormone to produce the heat. 
and um, this leads to them using a lot of calories and this is why we had this weight loss right in the beginning Thermogenesis also requires oxygen with glucose, which puts a further de demand on the baby. Um, and this can lead to respiratory compromise because now the baby has to breathe faster because it needs oxygen to generate heat and it can become hypoglycemic, which will further compound the situation. The, this will also decrease cardiac output, create acid-base problems, and can lead to coagulation problems. So having a baby cold can lead to a possible DIC and it will reduce the cerebral blood flow. If it reduces the cerebral blood flow, this is when the intraventricular hemorrhage happens. And we know from the latest research that intraventricular hemorrhages commonly happen in the first 24 hours of birth. And the reason for this is very often temperature instability. Humidification is an important method of controlling temperature, especially in the microprem. So the new hybrid incubators do a wonderful job because they almost mimic the uterus in controlling the humidity that keeps the baby warm. It's not just a humid environment, it's a warm, humid environment. It also prevents body um, heat loss and fluid loss. Because you've got this humid environment, the, and, and we look at the skin almost um, as, as a diffusion membrane, if it is very balanced, we don't have a lot of fluid loss. If it is an imbalance, so if the humidity is, um, the temperature is too high or the humidity is too low, the baby will still lose fluid. It is not advisable to dry the micro prep, but rather place them wet into that bag and cover the bag with as much, uh, with a blanket as quickly as you possibly can during the resuscitation of the baby. Hyperthermic, well, hypothermia is considered iatrogenic. This means that it's caused by devices. The newborn, um, in the newborn, it could be due to maternal sepsis. So if a baby is born with a high temperature, it's because the mother most likely had a high temperature at, this, at, at birth. Phototherapy can cause hypothermia. Excess blankets and swaddling can cause it. Late onset sepsis after 21 days will cause it. Dehydration can lead to it. And central nervous system problems can lead to it. So what are the signs of hypothermia? And we often see this on babies where the temperature control is not being done correctly. So very often when I walk into a unit, I will find that the temperature probe from the various resuscitation devices is not um, applied correctly. There isn't a reflector on that temperature probe. But in, instead, people are using a piece of plaster or they're using um, or any type of plaster to hold that temperature probe in place. And very often, people that don't know will place that probe over the liver. The liver has a far higher temperature than anywhere else in the body. So if you put the temperature probe on a liver, you will get an incorrect reading. The same way as if you put the temperature probe, God help us, on the scapula or the bony part of the back, because you will get an inappropriate reading there as well. You will get a lower temperature and the machine will just keep putting up its radiant heat and the baby actually will overheat because the temperature probe can't do its job properly. So how do we know a baby is, is, is hypothermic? Very often they are red, they flushed, they do have a tachycardia and a tachypnea, they can have hypotension, in long term they will de develop dehydration, they can become they can develop hypotonia, hypotonia is a floppy baby, they can really feed poorly and the consequences of hypothermia is hypotension, dehydration, seizures, hypernatremia or apnea.
apnea, tachycardia, and tachypnea are the biggest reasons um, for you to check the temperature of a baby. If a baby suddenly becomes tachycardia, tachypnea, and apnea, check the temperature first and make sure that the probe is, is, is on the baby properly and that the probe has got a reflector on it because very often it is there where the problem is. Babies generally cannot generate a, a hypothermia before 21 days as a sign of infection. They generally become hypothermic, not hyperthermic. So what sh should the temperature be? And this is where the trick comes in about hemodynamics in neonatal intensive care. If you know your hemodynamics, you can control the situation and you will much quicker realize your baby is getting better or getting sick. So we divide the newborn in three categories. We talk about the term baby, the preterm baby, and the micro preemie baby. The term baby is a baby 39 completed weeks and more. The preterm baby is generally considered 32 weeks to 38 weeks completed. And the micro preemie is a baby under 32 weeks gestation. So when we look at the temperature, the term baby wants his temperature between 36.6 to 37. The preterm baby wants his temperature between 36.7 and about 37. The micro preemie needs his temp between 36.8 and 37.2. As the micro preemie grows, he will go into the preemie phase because he'll gain a bit of weight, he'll get a bit fatter, he'll get a bit happier, and so it will continue onwards. So don't think because the baby was born micro preemie, the temp must always be there. You have to adjust for where the baby is going. The baby is likely to reduce cortis release cortisol, which may cause changes in the brain long term if the temperature is not maintained. So how do we maintain this temperature? Uh, um, you will see there that it talks about the newborn temperatures um, up until about 37.5. A big newborn, a 3.5 to 4.5 kilogram newborn definitely doesn't want its temp at 37.5. It very often only wants its temp at about 36.8. But a 22-weeker will definitely want a temperature of about 37.2 to be able to maintain a neutral thermal environment. What is a neutral thermal environment? It is an environment where the least oxygen and the least glucose is being utilized by the body. So how do we, how do we maintain the body temperature? Well, we do this via the Neo Health bag. We do this via a plastic bag. If you don't have a Neo Health bag, Neo Health bag is a specific one designed for um, resuscitation in newborns. Um, it has a little uh, hood that you can pull and it has, um, it has a Velcro stripping which allows for the doctors to be able to insert an umbilical catheter if necessary. But if you don't have that, a plastic bag will do. Warm blankets help, hats always help. And booties, um, socks also help. The minute you put the hat on and you put the socks on, the temperature almost no, 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 normalizes. KMC, kangaroo mother care or skin to skin will allow for normalization of the baby. If the baby appears born, what we used to call BBA, born before arrival, and the baby arrives Ice cold, one of the quickest ways of warming it up is allowing it to be on daddy's chest because men have a higher temperature than women. Incubators are obviously the best way to do this, but it, you know, if it's not there, KMC and putting a hat on the head or even using um, tubigrip 
um, for a hat will work or even a sock will work. <clears throat> if we are transporting a baby, we would like to transport the baby um, obviously in an incubator where possible in a transport incubator but if that doesn't happen we can use a ziplock or a new help bag with warm blankets placing a hat on while doing procedures is absolutely essential um, and one of the first things that you can say to a mom is do you have a hat with you take the hat if the hat is too big it does not matter guys make it work Make it work, stick some plaster and tie it down or find a way of keeping that hat in place. It also gives the mommy something to do. Ensure, as I said, that the temperature probe is placed correctly. If you look at this picture um, on the right, you will see that that temperature probe is incorrect. Yes, it's got a reflector on, but it's sitting right on the liver. That is going to give us a false reading. Ensure the incubator is in the correct mode. Ensure that the correct probe cover is being used. The correct probe cover is there, but it's in the incorrect place. Remember that you have peripheral versus core temperature and utilize skin to skin as much as you can. The, um, this picture to the right, one of the, so they put on the hat, which is great but they would have possibly done a little bit better if they had placed the blanket over the legs while they are busy working with that baby. Um, you can clearly see here that they are looking at preductal saturation because you will see that it is on the little right arm where they would expect to get a good saturation reading. So when we look at hemodynamics, we look at heart rate, we look at temperature, we look at resp respiration rate, we look at blood glucose, we look at urine output, and we look at the blood pressure. And these readings tell us a lot of what is going on with your baby. The heart rate is the number of contractions of the heart muscle over a minute. And as I said to you before, um, when a newborn baby's heart is not a complete muscle, it is actually more of a tendon. So it can't create stroke volume. All it can do is beat faster. And that's often what it will do. So where will we measure it? We measure it via the pulses or via an ECG reading. Where would you look? Carotid brachial or femoral would be your best bet in a, a newborn baby. On a monitor, it is done via the ECG leads and the placement of these leads are very important. For you to get a decent reading, you need a wide triangle. And you will see in this picture that we have a wide triangle. It gives us a far better ECG reading than if Perhaps these, the top two ECG leads, well, they hear they're brown and white, were actually moved closer into the chest. That would give us a more distorted ECG reading. Please be very aware that you cannot place an a ECG lead over the baby's nipple. At this stage in development, the nipple contains the entire breast tissue that is required for a baby, for a baby to develop breasts if she's a girl later in life. If you put an ECG lead on a baby's nipple and it's a micropremie and you rip the nipple off in the process, it could mean that long term that baby does not develop a nipple and does not develop a breast. So please be very care, careful when you take care of the skin. A micropremie usually has a heartbeat between 140 and 180 beats per minute, a premie 130 to about 160, and a term baby 100 to 150. Guys, this is your biggest indicator that a baby is asleep, stressed, in pain, perhaps dehydrated or overloaded. 
you need to know what the heart rate's average was yesterday so that you can compare it and notice that the baby is not as well or is getting better. A stressed baby pushes up its heart rate. A baby in pain, yes, preemies get pain. Term babies have pain, will push up their heart rate. And if you have a micro preemie and it becomes dehydrated, the first sign will be its heart rate starts beating faster and faster. The trend remains very important. As I have said, the ECG is read off a triangle. The position of the three leads on the chest are as follows. Take care to avoid areas where muscle movement can interfere as well with transmission. So there's very little muscle movement up towards the scapula. Ach, the, up towards the top. So the right arm must just be below the right clavicle. The left arm just below the left clavicle. And the um, lower leg, the left leg or the lower chest can be used just above or left from the umbilicus. That will give you a wide enough triangle for a good reading on any monitor. Please remember that monitors are developed with adults in, 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 their, in their, the way they develop monitors. It is very hard to develop a monitor for newborns or for neonates. They do have the, um, um, the, the module, they can do it, but it is often a bit of an inaccurate module. So the placements of your ECG leads are very important as well as the attachment of your leads. If the leads are loose, you are not going to get an accurate reading. Respiration. This is the number of times a baby breathes per minute. And mostly, this is the worst done parameter in the hospital. There's a lot of guessolitis that happens. People just guess the respiration. They don't look at it. And you can often tell that by just looking at the observations. <clears throat> we don't only monitor the number, but how it occurs. Please remember that the prem baby breathes like a little frog. Breathe, 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 stop. Breathe, 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 stop. Breathe, 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 stop. Because remember that the um, respiration center in the brain is not fully developed at this stage and so that is why they breathe in that manner we don't only monitor the number but how it occurs we need to consider that the lung is aerating so for a prem baby it's 40 to 60 breaths for a term a premi, uh, for a micro preemie it's 40 to 60 breaths for a preemie it's 30 to 60 breaths and for a term baby, it's 30 to 55 breaths per minute. Please consider that this is how babies breathe. And please be aware of the airway and breathing at all times. If the baby is not correctly positioned on the resuscitator, the airway will collapse. So I'm just going to go back here and show you the structural problems. You can see that there's a narrow subglottis, a high larynx, and a large tongue. And all of those will contribute if the baby is not placed correctly in on the resuscitator to a problem developing with its breathing. It does need to have that slight extension, which allows for the airway to remain open. Saturations. Saturation is the level of oxygen delivered to the tissue and can be directly affected by the baby's temperature. If a baby is born with a lower temperature or it gets cold or it's winter or the baby's born before arrival, often the little limbs are blue. 
that is not going to give you a good saturation reading. Saturation is also dependent on the blood pressure. And here I need to explain something to you. A saturation monitor has been developed or was developed by taking marine soldiers and making them hypoxic. So the saturation levels are really only accurate on a monitor to about on a monitor to about the level of 80%. After that, it is very, very much an algorithm. And so the, 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 once again, the attachment and how the saturation probe is put in place will tell us a lot about what is happening. So it is dependable on blood pressure. If your baby has a weak blood pressure, it is not, or a low blood pressure, if it's hypertensive, it is going to battle with its saturation levels. So you need to make sure that the saturation probe, A, is clean, B, attached correctly, and see that the limbs are warm enough. So what do we want the blood, uh, the saturation levels to be? Between, for a micropremie, between 88 and 94%. If the baby is on oxygen and the saturations remain above 94%, you should actually wean the oxygen. The premie, similar. The term baby, we will allow for it to go to 100%. If the baby's in room A and the saturations are above 94% or at 100%, that's fine. But please be aware that you can have a difference between the left hand and the right hand. Not the left foot and the right foot. The left hand versus the right hand will give you a difference. So what happens with blood pressure? Blood pressure is the pressure of blood against the arteries during the contraction of the heart. It is measured in systolic and diastolic, as you know. And in neonatal intensive care, we should be working off the mean blood pressure. And what we want it to be is gestational age plus two. So what we're looking at, if the baby's a 30-weeker, we want the mean blood pressure to be 32. Very often, babies are born with either a wide blood pressure or a narrow blood pressure. And that is why the mean blood pressure is better to work on. Mean blood pressure tells us about organ perfusion, how much or how well an organ is perfusing. And those of you who have been working in intensive care for many years knows how important organ perfusion is. That if a child loses, a baby loses its organ perfusion to its kidney, the result is it can actually develop renal failure. If it loses its um, perfusion to its gut, it can develop NEC. If it loses perfusion to its brain, it can develop an IVH. So monitoring that blood pressure is very, very important. As I said, it tells us about tissue, tissue perfusion and the cuff placement is very important. If the cuff, the cuff has to be two thirds of the upper limb or the lower limb length. So if you're going to put a blood pressure cuff on the upper on the upper arm, it must be two-thirds the size of the humerus. If you're going to put it on the leg, it must be two-thirds two of the size of the tib fib. Not the entire leg, the tib fib, and not the entire arm, the humerus. It must be placed correctly. You cannot put the arm blood pressure cuff on the leg. It ain't going to work because the leg will be longer than the humerus. So it's very important that your cuff size is correct. Blood glucose. Blood glucose tells us and tells me an incredible amount 
of what the baby is busy doing. If you look at most neonatal intensive care books, they speak about um, the child developing hypoglycemia. To me, hypoglycemia is a serious, serious sign. You don't see it as often as you see hyperglycemia because hyperglycemia is a sign of stress. Glucose is one of the fuels which allow the cell to activate to be normal. Glucose is measured in many mol per liter or deciliter and it's usually somewhere between 2.4 and 7 and in actual fact at the moment um, the latest research says it can go as low as 2.1. Please guys it's very very important that if you're doing a heel prick you do not prick those babies centrally. One of the biggest problems of prem and term babies that have been in intensive care long term is that they walk on their tiptoes. The reason for that is because we have damaged the nerve that runs centrally on the foot by doing the heel pricks. But not only that. The constant tactile pain that is happening to those babies, they will long-term develop tactile aversions. They hate grass, they hate sand, they won't walk barefoot or they will only walk barefoot, they don't tolerate shoes. This is all due to us inflicting pain on their feet. Please, we need to be very, very careful when we deal with them there. One of the other problems that occur here on a regular basis is that um, we often, and a lot of people don't know this, but if you have a fluctuating glucose, in other words, a very high glucose or a low glucose, the minute you give that baby, buckle feed that baby, in other words, put colostrum in their mouth, the glucose starts to stabilize. And this is one of the biggest or the quickest ways of controlling a blood glucose is getting as much colostrum orally as you can. Urine output. Urine output tells us a lot. It tells us about the blood pressure. And it tells us about tissue perfusion. Because if you don't have decent tissue perfusion, you're not going to produce urine. Please remember that most prim babies, and sometimes term babies as well, are born in what we term high output failure. In other words, they secrete more fluid than they should because the kidney is very immature. The nephron only starts really functioning from about 32 weeks. It is not even there before that. And so it's very important that you monitor the urine output of the baby. So we must test the urine and we should monitor it. And you want that urine output to be 0.5 to 1 mole per kilogram per hour. You can either put on a urine bag or weigh the nappies but mostly we find that these babies are secreting up to two to three moles per kilogram of fluid every hour. And that is where we lose control because basically they dehydrate via their skin and via their kidney. What is the sensory impact <clears throat> of an intensive care and of a healing environment? Well, if you were to look at the baby at the end of its, uh, at the, in, in the last three months of pregnancy, you must know a few things. Firstly, we do not have five senses. We have eight senses. There are three senses in your head. The first one is called vestibular, which is your balance, but it's also the movement left to right or rocking left to right moving forward, backwards, front to back, moving up and down, and even being upside down. And vestibular movement 
um, for a baby that goes to term in pregnancy is the waddling that happens because the mother, that baby's just got so big. And even if you're thin as a pin or round as a ball, you're going to waddle. And that baby can get up to um, 20 hours a day of vestibular movement. Well, what's the significance, Linda, you ask me? The significance is that the vestibular system takes the five senses that come from outside and it takes it through the central brain and it goes and it puts it in the right place. It basically acts like a filing clock. So vestibular movement is very important because the growth of a brain from 26 weeks to 40 weeks is 70%. It has to grow with, by 70%. Without vestibular movement, that brain becomes foggy. The next um, sense that is in your head is something called proprioception. So as the baby, the uterus is the second strongest muscle in the body. And as the baby, as the baby grows, the uterus will stretch till about 30 to 32 weeks. Then the uterus has had it. It's not stretching anymore. And what it's now doing is flexing the baby. And by flexing the baby, it is folding the baby in and the baby goes upside down. Upside down, more vestibular, flexing and pushes all the limbs into the midline. And that allows for the baby to learn where it can move its arm. So it allows muscles and joints to develop and everything else. If you consider what happens to the prem baby lying in an incubator, if that baby was in utero and it needed to move its arm from its chest, it would probably only lift it about a centimeter or two. Think of your prem baby in the incubator right now. It can take its arm and fling it and lay it behind its ear. That shouldn't happen. So those two senses are there. And then there's a third sense that some people say exists and some people say don't exist. And this is called introception. So it's the ability to control and regulate. And this is where it becomes very interesting. Because when you've had, when somebody's been shocked or had bad news or something's happened, what's the first thing we do? Yes, we bring sugar water, that's standard. But then people say, oh, Linda, just breathe. Breathe in, breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. And that allows me to get control over my heart rate, over my blood pressure over my saturation. This can't happen in the newborn baby. And so what happens? The baby's born, it lands in intensive care, there's light. If the mommy in the middle of the day went and stood naked in the sunshine, she would not, that baby would not see that light. There is sound. The baby does not get any sound in utero except the mother's voice, the heartbeat, and the intestinal movements. There is touch in intensive care. The baby in utero self-touches. Nobody else touches it. Even if the mother was to touch, the fluid would move, but it wouldn't really feel it. A newborn baby, whether it's 22 weeks or whether it's 42 weeks, knows its mother by her smell and her taste, because Lycor, breast milk, and skin smell and taste the same. So we stressing these babies out in intensive care, not just with the fact is that they are there and we've not controlled their neutral thermal in their environment, but the light impacts on them, the sound impacts, the touch impacts, and we remove the mother. You can only visit one hour a day. That baby has nothing to say, this is my mommy, I'm okay. Also, the positioning becomes very important. It is not natural to lie on your back with your arms out like a bat. It is normal to be flexed. And so for these babies, in the golden hour, getting them flexed, we are giving neuroprotection. 
Keeping the noise level down, we are giving Nero protection. Keeping the noise level down, we are giving Nero protection. Doing only what we really need to do and reducing the toxic touch, we are giving Nero protection. So, correct positioning can reduce pain and stress, minimize your medical handling and ensure that you are as quiet as possible. Please do not talk while you are putting in IV therapy or doing a painful procedure because I can promise you now it won't take long and that baby will associate your voice with pain. Remember that the baby is now fighting gravity and that neonatal intensive care is not, sorry for the spelling error, a normal environment. Starting KMC skin to skin as early and as appropriately for the baby and mom as you can will normalize both patients' hemodynamics. As I said, touch, light, and sound can be very toxic, and incorrect positioning is very painful. Allowing the mom to settle the baby by touching, talking, or humming. So I prefer the moms to hum from about, well, in the micro-prem phase. Once they get to premie phase, then singing becomes important, as well as allowing the mother to cup and hold the baby becomes very important. Just feeling her will help. Safeguarding sleep becomes very, very important. Um, and sleep is critical. A lot of babies don't sleep in intensive care. We don't give them the opportunity to sleep and we make too much noise. That baby doesn't know that the alarm going off in bed A is not his alarm where he's in bed B. He just knows that when that happens, somebody's going to come and hurt me. So it's important that we keep it as quiet as possible and allow them to sleep for as long as possible. Sleep ensures the correct behavior with regards to learning, memory, impulse control, and social competence. And you are adding to that as you nurse that baby. Bonding, or as I call it, attachment, is dependent on how well a baby sleeps. And prem babies sleep longer and lighter than term babies. I cannot tell you the amount of sleep problems I have later with these babies. Prem babies battle with self-soothing and remain asleep and to remain asleep at night. And the same happens with the sick baby. Discharged preemies often need longer periods of sleep during the day to integrate sensory input. And it's very important that they are allowed to sleep. Babies who do not sleep enough often deregulate, mouth down, and one of their biggest signs of them not regulating would be reflux. So sensory, the essential impact is that sleep heals. Most ICU babies suffer sleep deprivation and very often later present with something called... In the, um, in our virtual studio here in Dubai, and um, as I introduced myself earlier, my name is Margarita Singer, and I'm the regional marketing manager for neonatal care at Drager. So today, based on the lecture that Linda has um, shared with us, I would like to make a technology insight into the incubators. Incubators overall, and here, as an example, we have Isolet 8000 from Drager. So um, I know that Linda has addressed uh, quite a lot about the four ways of the heat transfer and also the importance to offering thermoneutral environment right after birth. And I think she spent quite a bit of time talking about the importance of kangaroo mother care, so KMT. And of course, this should still be our priority to give the time for the child and for the mother to build the bond in the first um, uh, in the first hour in the golden hour. However, we do know that sometimes, especially with the extremely low birth weights uh, preterm infants, we don't have much time, and we need to transfer them 
directly into the neonatal care unit. And um, in majority of the NICUs, we do have um, different devices. So we have the possibility to have the closed care incubator, like we, can, we, we have here, or um, sometimes we only have access to the open care devices, such as um, radiant, uh, radiant warmers. And uh, next uh, month's webinar, we're going to spend more time on the resuscitator modules and on the open care um, devices. And today, I would like to highlight some of the advantages of the uh, closed care incubators. So, as I mentioned here, we have the Isolate 8000 Plus, a closed care incubator. And before we start with uh, admitting the patient, what we need to do, we need to make sure that the device is ready for operation. So what we need to do, we need to turn on the device. So the turn on button is located, um, is located under the main display. So we press on the turn on button. Obviously the device needs to be connected into the power supply. And uh, the device goes through the assured self-check uh, functionality. So basically, it's testing the uh, electronics inside the device. And then we immediately start in the air operation. So air mode means that we set the temperature inside the incubator, and the incubator maintains that temperature throughout all the operations. So um, what we have here, we have the main display where and the main control unit where you can basically make all of your, all of your settings and look at the trends. Um, you have the humidifier chamber where we need to put in the water in order to be able to increase humidity in the incubator. I think Linda has mentioned the importance to offer the humidity especially to the lower birth weights uh, preterm infants because of the risk of heat loss through evaporation. We know that preterm infants have underdeveloped skin and the water loss, especially if the temperature inside the incubator is not optimized, the water loss can be substantial. And of course, the water loss leads to the heat loss through evaporation. So, uh, that's why it is important to offer optimal humidity control inside the incubator chamber. So how do we activate humidity? First of all, we can open the humidifier compartment and we can take out the humidification module. So that's how the humidification module looks like. Um, so basically we just need to put in the water. Uh, you see that I removed the cap. We can put in the water. There is a maximum limit. Let me just uh, change the view so you can see uh, better. Um, so basically we have the view uh, and you can see that there is the maximum capacity line. You fill in with distilled water you put the cap back on. Basically, you just need to spread. And you uh, put in the humidification chamber back into the operation. So it's a very easy to remove and uh, uh, put back the humidification chamber. You just need to pull on the handle and it will automatically be removed. And you see that uh, the uh, putting back in and out the humidification chamber takes a little bit of practice. So if you do have a, a preterm infant, Linda has been talking a lot about reducing the stress, reducing the noise. So it is better to actually prepare the humidification prior to the admitting of the patient. So we can reduce the noise associated with the uh, um, putting the humidifier back in. So uh, now, since we're already in this view, let's have a look at how we can uh, actually start the operation. So um, here, when we turn on our device, we start in the air mode. So what does it mean? What does an air mode mean? 
basically you're setting up the um, uh, temperature inside the incubator and the incubator maintains the temperature throughout the time. So now, even if we open the access port, um, we would uh, see the uh, we would see that uh, uh, if we look at the trends, uh, we would see um, skin temperature one, oxygen, humidity, heat, and power. So. Um, so we would see that even with open um, uh, access ports, the device would make sure and it would increase the heating output to maintain the set temperature. There is, of course, allowed certain fluctuation, uh, but the device would aim to uh, maintain the same temperature control. So, um, and this would be this could be your starting point or this can be used as a standby mode to warm up the incubator and to keep it warm. So we can start in uh, keeping the incubator around 35 degrees. This is our starting point. And of course, we can then increase the uh, temperature. So you see there is a safety control in this uh, incubator. There is a lock button, so which prevents from accidental change of the settings. So now, in order to unlock, we need to press the unlock button and we can change the setting of the temperature control by using the arrow up and down. So now let's say we know that we have a preterm infant coming in or about to come in. So we would set our temperature to 36 degrees and the incubator would uh, start to increase the temperature because we are not quite there. So, um, and this can be used uh, in a standby mode before the baby comes. However, I think Linda in her lecture has also mentioned um, quite a lot about the offering customized thermoneutral environments. So, we don't have a solution for all babies. Every baby, especially depending on the gestational age, depending on the the birth weight um, requires its own thermoneutral environment. And therefore, it is recommended to use the skin mold when it comes to the, uh, to the neonatal care, and especially closed care incubators. So what we can do, we can switch into the skin mold operation. What does the skin mold operation mean? If while we are in the uh, uh, air mode, we can still measure the skin temperature, but we don't use it to control the heater output. If we now switch to the skin mode, we now would set the target skin temperature of the baby, and the device would automatically change the heater output and the temperature inside the incubator to ensure that this temperature is maintained at all times. So we are offering more server control or more patient-driven control and more stable temperature um, uh, maintenance uh, inside the incubator. So how do we switch into the skin mode? We again need to press on the unlock button. We can use the skin uh, and we then set our desired skin temperature. So depending again on the gestational age um, of the baby and just depending on the uh, birth weight of the baby, you would then be able to set the skin temperature. So now what you could see that we have the set skin temperature uh, parameter, we have the current measurements of the skin temperature and obviously you have the air temperature inside the incubator and currently we see that we're still warming up we, because we started the device not so long ago but the, what the device would try to do the device would try to increase its heating output to the maximum you can actually see here 
that our heater output is running at 100%. So we started at 100, then we went down because uh, we already reached the desired temperature, and now we run again at a maximum 100 capacity in order to try to reach the set skin temperature as fast as possible. And we also can see, if we look at the trends, so if we look at the trends, um, we can change uh, trends, um, air temperature. So you can see the air temperature has also been gradually reducing. So we can also see, and this is particularly important because um, you can check whether the baby, the baby temperature is stable or not. If the baby temperature is stable, then the temperature inside the incubator would also be more or less stable. If you see a significant fluctuation of the air temperature, you would probably notice that your baby is thermal and stable. So we need to optimize the uh, care for that baby. So, um, Again, you see that our air temperature is gradually increasing in order to reach the desired skin temperature. So now, when we are operating in the skin mode, um, we are using baby's skin temperature as the mechanism or as a servo uh, control to measure the te uh, to to set up the temperature inside the incubator. So, um, and of course by setting the appropriate temperature inside of the incubator, we are um, addressing the uh, topic of um, convection. So we are eliminating the risk of convecting heat loss or heat gain um, by optimizing the temperature inside the incubator. But I did mention at the beginning of the demonstration that um, it is quite important to also optimize the heat loss through evaporation by adding the humidity. Because the baby, when it's still in utero, it's floating in the amniotic fluid. So it's a very humid, so to say, uh, or 100% saturated environment. When the baby is born, in majority of cases, I don't know how it is in South Africa, but when I was delivering my baby here in Dubai, the uh, operating theater was extremely, extremely cold. So um, thus, uh, when the baby is born, there is a higher risk of very fast heat loss. And I think Linda has addressed the risks of fast heat loss um, during uh, in, in her lecture. So what we can do, how we can optimize this evaporative heat loss when the baby is already inside the incubator? we can actually activate the humidity. So again, we unlock the screen and we can activate the humidity. So we have the possibility to put the humidity on or off. So let me just add a little bit of water into the uh, chamber so I could uh, demonstrate how the humidity would work. Uh, we can activate the humidity and we can set the humidity level from 35 to, uh, starting from 35, so we activate the humidity, uh, we start the on, and uh, we can basically, uh, current humidity is measured at 27 because we are here in Dubai in winter and our, temp our air is very dry in winter, so we can set the humidity and uh, we can reach the humidity of 50%. Of course, we can change the humidity and we can change the humidity by using the hours up and down. And again, uh, this humidity can be set based on the gestational age and the um, uh, birth weights of the infant, of the preterm infants. So now we will all ha also have the information in the trends for the humidity control uh, on the incubator. So you can see if, for example, we want to see how the humidity control um, changes, I can go into the trends again. 
and I can display different information. So we can also trend the humidity. Currently, we are at the lowest level of humidity, 30%, and we will gradually increase once the system is preheated. So once again, I would like to highlight that if we know that there is a high risk baby coming into the NICU, what we could do, we could already prepare, preheat and pre-warm the incubator in order to uh, optimize the environment before the baby comes in. Because obviously it takes time to increase the temperature, it takes time to increase the humidity. And if we place our baby uh, into the environment that is not warm enough and that is not optimized from the thermoneutral environment perspective, then we are still subjecting our baby to a potential hypothermia and the risks associated with the heat loss. So um, this is what it, when it comes to the operating of the device. So we address the topic of, of air control, we address the topic of skin control, we address the topic of humidity control. There is of course the possibility to activate oxygen, but I think uh, we will talk about the oxygen delivery when we talk about the respiratory system in a bit more details. Um, and in the meantime, I would like to highlight to you a few other things that are incorporated in the design of an incubator in order to reduce the risk of heat loss. So um, what Linda was talking about is the radiative heat loss. So the heat loss that is associated with cold surfaces. And that's why in the isolate, we have a dual wall structure. So you can see this is the wall number one and this is the wall number two. So even if the temperature is not optimized in the NICU, and sometimes I've been to some NICU where the temperature inside the NICU is 22, 23 degrees, which is, I find very cold even for an adult ICU and let alone for the NICU. And in order to reduce the risk of radiative heat loss, we have the dual uh, dual wall setup, dual wall design. So the inner wall is always um, main is always warm. Let me just quickly switch into the air mode to avoid uh, potential um, alarms. We don't want to have alarms. And I'm also going to um, switch off the humidity <clears throat> for the time being. Uh, Okay, so uh, as I was saying, we have dual wall design so that the inner wall is always maintained warm, even if the outer wall is exposed to the cooler air in the nickel. And because we have this space, the air inside generates additional insulation, preventing um, from uh, the uh, cold air in the nickel affecting the inside of the incubator. So we are eliminating all potential risks to ensure that we maintain thermoneutral, thermostable environments in the NICU. Also, um, um, what's interesting in, in the incubator here in the isolate is that we have a dual air curtain. So dual air curtain has also been designed um, in order to prevent um, heat loss during procedures. Because normally when we access our baby, we would use the side port. So we would open the port and we would either open one, but normally it would be two ports to access and perform the procedure on the baby. And when we are opening the port, obviously the heat from the outside of the incubator would uh, go out and the, the most important is that the cool air from the NICU uh, would get in into inside the incubator. But because uh, of the dual air curtain, we actually prevent this cool air from the NICU, from the ambient environment, to get in into the incubator. So how does the dual air curtain work? Basically, it is the air flow it's the aerodynamic inside the incubator 
obviously because of the shape of the hood, it's the air flows that flows from the side, so from the side where the air comes, inside the incubator, going in the middle and then creating a second curtain to prevent or to reduce the heat loss. So basically the air flow goes onto the walls, coming in and then tra traveling again. And because of this uh, air, air dynamic, we can actually ensure that the baby is kept warm even during the access points and even during the procedures. There are quite, I think there are quite a few, if not studies, but at least case studies that have demonstrated the advantages of having the dual air curtain, especially during the procedures. Um, so, and obviously that prevents the convective heat loss and that prevents the um, uh, radiative heat loss. And humidity prevents the evaporative heat loss. So we are already having just one incubator. We are already addressing three main ways of uh, potential heat loss that can affect our preterm babies. Mm -hmm. If we talk about the conductive heat loss, obviously this is the heat loss associated with the touch of the cold surfaces, but um, it's not really influencing us here in our incubator because the mattress is located inside the incubator. So that means it is pre-warmed and kept warm at all times. So obviously having, oh, we have a soft mattress here. So obviously having the mattress inside um, helps us also to prevent the conductive heat loss. Um, also what's really good about modern incubators and in particular about the Isolate 8000 and 8000 Plus is that we have also integrated scale. So normally, um, what, or, yes. Margarita, sorry to interrupt. You went on to the OBS screen, so we can only see a very small ah, picture. Sorry. No problem. Yes. Okay. Now it's better? Yes, it's better. And if you can stand a bit closer to better? the device, we can see you a bit better also. Okay. Excellent. Thank you, Katya, for that. Um, so, um, where was I? Oh yeah, so the modern incubator, previously in the clinical practice, what, in, order, in, in order for us to weigh our babies, we would have to take the baby out of the incubator, place them on the cold scale, and then measure the weight of the scale, or me measure the weight of the baby. And of course, this is associated with uh, potential risk of uh, convective heat loss because we're taking the baby out of the warm environment and conductive heat loss because we're placing the baby on the cold surface of the um, scale. So, so now the advantage of the modern incubators um, is that we have integrated scale and we can weight our baby without the necessity to take them out during the weighting procedure. So we are performing our daily uh, uh, daily procedures basically without disturbance to the baby. So, uh, and especially Linda was addressing the topic of the right positioning uh, of the baby. And if we position the baby once, we don't want to disturb the baby and change the position too often um, in order to, uh, especially during the procedures. So that's why having the uh, scale integrated uh, in the device uh, supports the workflow in, in, in your nucleus. So what we can do, we can actually, obviously now we don't have the baby inside, but we can access the scale and now we waited the baby. Uh, we are waiting, so we see that it's uh, on the bar and I'm gonna, I can show it to you in a closer. So we are currently waiting um, the baby. And uh, then once the waiting is done, and let me try to put something more substantial inside. So we can also zero. Uh, what we need to do, we need to basically press on zeroing, and then we would need to put our baby up, and that is what the uh, incubator tells you. 
here we failed. Okay, let's try again. So we take everything off the mattress and uh, we perform the zeroing. And the device tells you that uh, what, what, what's needed. It shows you that the baby needs to be put up. So we're performing the zeroing. And then uh, so currently, let me see what is preventing it. Zeroing. So again, let's try again. We are performing the zeroing of the baby. And then we can basically put the, uh, I can wait. So we can try to wait the uh, baby inside the incubator. It, it doesn't usually take so long as it takes me here because there are quite a few cables inside, but normally this, the waiting uh, would be done quite fast. So you see now here that we measured at 325 grams and we have the possibility to store the weight. So now if we go into our trends, we can um, check, we can actually, we can actually uh, display uh, the weights on the display here. So you see the weight gain in grams in the last seven days. So you see, the first key, the first measurement and the last. So you get the information about the uh, first measurement when the baby was admitted to the NICU and the last, obviously, which is of the uh, last measurement of the day. And you also will see the trended value on whether the baby is gaining the weight or not. So this information would be available to you at any point of time. The trend is available for up to seven days. Um, and this is basically most important things that we address uh, when it comes to the incubator. However, there's one more thing that I would like to talk about and it's, um, it's the incubator cover. This is another way on how we can reduce potentially the heat loss, especially in the cooler environment. I know that in majority of the African countries, the climate is quite warm, so it might not be a challenge per se. But uh, if you do notice that there is, you know, cooler, breathed air that is coming in into the NICU from either um, a um, air conditioning or from uh, the window, we can use an additional um, uh, hood cover in order to reduce the heat loss. So basically, we can also use this uh, hood cover as a way to uh, create the circadian rhythm. So basically the day and the night for the baby. And we're gonna address this in the later modules of the webinar, the developmental uh, care that is associated uh, with light uh, monitoring. And basically what you could do, you could use the skin cover. So you see the skin cover uh, in order to insulate the incubator. So you can also open one, but also you can use this to create the nightlife environment for the baby to ensure appropriate brain development as well. Um, I think I've covered most of the things associated with uh, the incubator and the uh, creating thermonutrial environment. Of course, there are a few uh, more workflow related things like for example, optimizing the height of the incubator. So in order for this demonstration, I put the incubator to the highest level so that it's easier to demonstrate, but you can adjust the height of the incubator to ensure easy access to the baby. So we need to make sure that it is comfortable for us to perform any procedures. Um, and also uh, there is a number of, um, uh, shelves and the number of uh, drawers available so you can actually keep um, nappies inside the drawers or even the temperature control um, uh, probes inside the drawers so you can actually optimize this 
as a personal bed space for your babies. Um, so with that, I would like to finish our practical demonstration and let me see if we can get back to Linda. Linda, um, can you hear and can you, uh, uh, did, did you have your sound back? Um, can you hear me now? Yes, now we can hear you much, can much you hear better. So, okay. I'm on my cell phone, so the last two slides would be optimizing nutrition, so that's getting breast milk in as quickly as we can. Um, and in the feeding module, we will uh, address the um, whole situation around fast versus slow feeding. But just to tell you that breast milk, and especially colostrum, crosses the blood-brain barrier and protects the brain long term. So it's very, very important that a baby starts its breast milk as quickly and as early as we can. Going forward, um, when you get the slide presentation, you will see that, um, and I cannot share my screen because I'm on my phone, you will see that there are articles there that you can click the link to read, and there are um, a few groups that you can follow on Twitter. Um, if Katya can read me the questions, I can quickly address a few questions and we can go on from there. Linda, I can uh, address the question. So we actually have received quite a few questions in the last um, hour. So um, basically, um, um, there was a question about the exchange transfusion. Uh, whether this topic is going to be covered later in the modules because um, it seems like it's a very important topic and there was an incident that happened at work recently and uh, baby had to be ventilated. Is it something that we are going to address at a later stage? Yes, we will address it in the endocrine module with regards to the um, jaundice and what happens there. So it is there, but if there's something specific they want to address, they can please just pop us an email and we will, I will work it in for you. It's not a problem. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, another question, during resuscitation with peak line babies, five to 10 minute bolus of fluids is acceptable considering that you have a lot of medication, TPN, lipids, in, uh, inotropes in the line. Thanks. That was a question. Sorry. Okay, so is it? I would, I would, if we're talking a pick line, the baby has already um, been uh, um, stabilized and has now become unstable and is being resuscitated. That's a very different approach to a newborn resuscitation. However, remembering that you can stop sort of infusions, and um, we are addressing <coughs> that sort of situation, Margarita, in the transportation of babies. So during resuscitation, you could very easily stop the TPN and utilize and flush that line and utilize that line to give a bolus. Um, there's no harm done. Research shows that you can start the TPN again once the baby is stable. Excellent, thank you. Um, there are two questions, I think similar uh, line. Can you clarify where is it recommended to place temperature probe in the baby uh, to monitor best the baby temperature? So the, the 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 most accurate place is usually to the left of the umbilicus, which will give you a generalized temperature, or to place it sort of on the lower back where you have more brown fat. And if you were to Google brown fat, you would get um, a picture generally of where the brown fat is available. But that would be the better place to place it. It is important though that we change the space, the place of placement regularly because that temperature probe can cause a pressure area. So you do want to move it. 
especially if a baby is edematous, because that would cause a problem. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, another question, how relevant is it to monitor a 12th lead ECG in the uh, and, uh, arrhythmias on a newborn? So 12 lead ECG is definitely not advisable unless there is a problem. Arrhythmia is something that is quite, um, is very specialized and should be moved to specialized regions. The most common problem that would occur within the um, neonatal environment with regard to the um, which um, would need to be addressed. And I do think we cover it in the cardiac um, period of time, but a 12 ECG is basically only requested when a cardiology appointment is done. And um, basically, most often than not, we only monitor on a three lead. Thank you, Linda. Um, also, there is a question. Could you please repeat what is Hello? the gestation stage for micropremies, premies, and term? So micropremies are considered between 30, uh, well, depending on what your country does and what's acceptable in South Africa, a baby is considered viable at 20 six weeks but we are resuscitating babies in South Africa from 30 from 22 weeks so a micro preemie is a, any baby with a gestational age of 32 weeks or less a preemie is from 32 weeks to 38 completed weeks and a term baby goes from 39 weeks and we do not look at weight generally because an SGA baby is could appear like a, a micro preemie, so a very low birth weight baby. Could okay. A, 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 we would look at the Ballard scores. We would look at um, gestational age. Okay, thank you, Linda. Responds because, as I said um, to you, a micro preemie another... baby will often pass a lot of blood flow. All right. Um, another question: Integrated scale is present in all isolate eight thousand, or is it an optional feature? It is an optional feature, but it is possible to upgrade this feature in the field. And majority of our isolates are being sold together with the integrated scale inside them. But it can also be selected that it is not there. So we can check on the configuration. And uh, also, I see that you're from South Africa. So uh, we have um, uh, registered your question. And I will make sure that our colleague in South Africa get in touch with you directly to check whether your units have the integrated scale or not. Thank you for that question. Um, there is. Uh, there is another question. Uh, the ideal fats, is it pre or post ductal reading? Pre ductally, if you're resuscitating. <clears throat> is to prevent an intraventricular hemorrhage. Sorry, Linda, I think we're losing you again. It seems like it, and... Uh, it does appear like it, I'm sorry. But now we can hear you again. Oh, okay, then can you repeat your question? Because I didn't get it. 
what is the ideal sats, uh, saturation? Is it the pre or post ductal readings? Pre ductally, when you're resuscitating, is the uh, most acceptable. Excellent. Um, is it important? Another question. Is it important to regulate humidity and how? And do we have a constant humidity as we care for the baby? Thanks. Uh, also, to talk to to continue this question. So this uh, sorry, it, it's not yet. Um, if working on a radiant warmer, how can one ensure humidity is not lost? So that's the same question. Okay, so um, when we talk about optimizing humidity, remember that there are changes that occur in a baby that might occur when they're born or when they're at a specific um, gestational age. There are two very interesting changes that occur in a baby when it is born premature. Within two weeks, the brain will go from white matter to gray matter and the skin keratinizes. So the idea with humidity is that we'll gradually reduce it over the two week period. And because by two weeks, if the baby is 24 weeks, 26 weeks or 36 weeks, the skin has keratinized. So we won't need that humidity after that period of time. So it's that, that, that is, um, um, a very important concept to have is that over two, the two week period we'll slowly wean the humidity um, with regards at what was the next part I've forgotten sorry if working on a radiant warmer how can one ensure humidity is not lost so there is a habit and we do see it quite often that they will use um, the plastic wrap that the food the food quality plastic wrap that they pull from side to side to prevent um, humidity loss this is totally acceptable in an emergency situation however it cannot be standardized throughout one cannot always accept it because a um, that plastic does secrete chemicals and the other reason for it is an infection control reason it is not um it creates so-called cold spots which become hot spots so it creates cold spots on the radiant heater where bugs can start growing which then becomes hot spots so it's better if you are seeing a lot of uh, micro premies that you rather use the hybrid incubators um, and not use the plastic method over the top. But it's totally acceptable if that's all you have. Excellent. Um, so another question that we just received is um, uh, why for baby Leo temperature corporal, probably the central one, is recommended to be used in liver or kidney area? I've never come across it, it that it's, it should be in the liver area. It is on the kidney area. Um, quite easily. So the liver usually is about one centimeter below the rib cage. But as far as I know, it goes just below that um, or near the kidney area. And it's very important in both the baby Leo and other hybrids that you have the dual temperature going. Please don't think that the foot pro is an optional extra. It isn't. The machine actually requires both temperatures to be able to calculate and maintain that temperature and heating. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, also, another question, is the incubator cover included with all isolates, 8,000 plus? Um, no, it is not. It depends on the configuration, but I think uh, we do supply them quite often. And of course, you can also order them separately as a line item for your incubators. We have the dedicated uh, food cover 
for the isolates, for the uh, for the uh, expensive thousands, and for the baby layer. So again, um, uh, we can follow up on your request, and I will make sure that our colleague in South Africa will come back to you with regards to the um, isolate food covers. Um, and so far, the final question. How do we reset the trends on the Draeger Isolate 8000? Does the trend automatically reset when switching on and off the device during admission discharge of the baby? Yes, so um, the trends, if the device is on throughout the entire time of the, while the baby is there, so you will get the trends on the display. And let me switch to the other screen for you. Uh, sorry. I've uh, put down the device and put it up. So uh, basically, the trend of the incubator can be uh, seen now. If I put it in the right place. Can be seen for um, if we go into the trends. Uh, we can select the hours, uh, display, for example, temperature, we can select 12 hours, 24 hours, 2 hours, 4 hours, and 8 hours. So the trend will be stored there up to 7 days, but you can display up to 24 hours. And when you discharge your baby and when you switch off the device, the trend will be automatically reset so that with the new admission, with the new, uh, with the new turning on the device, the trends will be reset and you will start from zero. So there, that's done automatically. Um, another question, uh, data can be exported. Yes, the data from the incubator, from the Isolate 8000 Plus, not the Isolate 8000, so that is the uh, uh, other model. So from Baby Leo and from the Isolate 8000 Plus, the data can be exported using the Medibus X uh, communication protocol. So basically, the um, uh, the trends uh, of the trends of the baby and the temperatures control can be all exported into the um, database. Yes, that that is possible. And um, I think um, we have answered all of our questions. Thank you very much for staying with us for the past three hours. I see that. Majority of you have stayed with us, so please share your feedback. Uh, after we finish the webinar, the webinar, you will be prompt to um, share your feedback in an anonymous survey. Please um, fill, fill the survey for us because we will use this as a basis to improve further. Of course, today we do um, apologize for the technical issues that we have experienced. We will make sure that in the next webinars we um, avoid potential technical difficulties. And I would like to thank you all for being here with us. I would like to thank Linda for your excellent, excellent lecture. I think it was so detailed and uh, so important to cover all of these aspects. And I think it was a great start of our neonatal nursing course. Please uh, register for the upcoming webinars. The next module will be on neonatal resuscitation. And then the following two modules will be on neonatal ventilation and the respiratory system of the neonates. Please join our webinars. Please share your feedback. Linda, thank you so much. And uh, we, will get, we, we will see you hopefully again in four weeks' time. Thank you and have a great day, everyone.